parents talk to their kids, say, oh, it's just a movie. Oh, that stuff's not real. Like, oh, it's just pretend or make believe. But nobody talks to kids about porn. And they freaking should because they are watching it. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Prestasia Foundation's podcast vodcast series, Sex, Human Rights, and CSA Prevention. My name is Megan Ingerman, and this month we'll be in conversation with adult movie star and production manager Allison Ray. Welcome, Allison. Hi, how's it going? Good. How about you? As good as it can be being stuck in here. So <laughs> I totally understand. I was going to say uh, welcome from quarantine. We're all in our houses right now doing this remotely. Cool. So you have an educational background in psychology, sociology, justice, as well as being a porn actress. Has this rather unique background left you with any insights into the relationship, if any, between pornography and real life sexual violence? It's interesting. Because on one hand, yes, and one hand, no. Um, from the educational background that I have, all of the classes that I've taken where pornography is talked about, I've encountered professors who will kind of advocate for the side that all porn is sex trafficking, no woman can consent to porn. Um, there's definitely classes where they'll, especially like the feminism classes I've taken, like being, you know, being a sociology uh, major. It's, it's actually very interesting to see how many people say, like to conflate porn with sex abuse and sex trafficking and take the stance that it's all abuse because women can't consent to it because there's money involved. Right. Um, say like, and, and the reasoning behind it being, well, if there wasn't money, she wouldn't be doing it. I'm like, well, if they weren't paying you to go clean their toilets, I'm sure you wouldn't be doing it either. Capitalism, there's no consent exactly. in capitalism. So that's like the worst argument I've heard for that ever. Mm -hmm. um, other than that, as far as like unique um, insights to the industry in that way, I don't think so. I think I think the unique insight, which isn't even all that unique because I think everyone in the sex industry can relate, is that I'm seeing how liberal colleges, and especially like liberal arts, view pornography and they view porn performers to be these trafficked, non-consenting people, people. and uh, they're not really getting the whole picture. Interestingly enough, I actually tried to do a thesis to interview I wanted to interview fellow performers and ask them about their experiences because I wanted to shed a positive light on the industry because there's so much negativity out there. And I could not find a professor to be the like, you know, the person on my project. So I ended up not being able to do it because no one agreed with me. They're like, I don't want it to be a, a you know, a, an ad for the industry. I'm like, it's not an ad. It's a different perspective. And so I see a lot of... Um, non-willingness to be flexible in their views about the industry, even, you know, from higher education standpoint. Mm -hmm. And so your feeling is that the industry can be, uh, I don't want to say safe place, but like a place where somebody can do their job and feel like they've done their job and not feel exploited. And Absolutely. Now that's not to say it doesn't happen. There are plenty of girls that I know personally and that I've seen online who felt exploited on set or they felt that their image was exploited um, in a way that they didn't consent to. It can definitely happen. But by and large, at least in my experience in this industry, it's been very positive. It's been all about consent. Almost every single set I've ever been on has been very careful to make sure that I'm comfortable, make sure I feel like I come in, I do my job, I go home, and that my limits aren't pushed unless it's like a BDSM scene where the intention is to push my limits and I am right. consenting to having them push my limits. But I've never really felt um, any strong abuse on set. And it, yeah, like, like you said, like I don't want to use the word porn. The industry is like a safe place because it's not for everybody. And also it all, it depends on the individual. Me, I'm very outspoken. I'm very, uh, aware of what I'm okay with and not okay with. And I'm not afraid to tell someone that if someone was a little bit less, 
I don't know, maybe abrasive is a good word as me, <laughs> they might not be as willing to say, hey, I don't like this or hey, I'm not comfortable doing this thing in this scene and then change it. So mm -hmm. it's safe and not safe. You have to advocate for yourself in this industry to make it a safe place for yourself. Uh, let's see. In many of the scenes that you've filmed, you play a barely legal character or barely legal characters, such as a babysitter, a schoolgirl, a cheerleader, etc. Do these scenario do these scenarios appeal to you personally, or were you simply cast that way and filmed them to appeal to your fans? Both, I guess. Um, I love the fun, barely legal cheerleader. Well, maybe not cheerleaders. Cheerleader is not really my favorite. I was never a cheerleader, but I was babysitter. Um, and it's fun because it does appeal to experiences I had when I was younger. You know, if people want to pretend that teenagers don't have sexual urges, they're lying to themselves. Like, I love playing a schoolgirl hitting on my teacher because that's all I wanted to do when I was like 16. I don't know if I can say that age, but it's true. Like, there was one very hot person at my school I'm not gonna say teacher whatever because I don't want to like give it away if they happen to watch this but I fantasized about them I never made a move but it's fun because I get to live out those fantasy scenarios through my work which is really fun now there's plenty that I've been thrown into just because I look young and it's just what we're doing in porn right now Right. But most of the time they're fun and I have a good time with them and they appeal to what I like. Okay, so jumping off of that point, uh, you've stated that you started watching porn when you were a child and that you were hypersexualized even back then. I can totally relate having been hypersexualized uh, from an early age as well. Um, how can we protect children from sexual abuse while still honoring and respecting rather than stigmatizing their sexuality? That's a really big question. So I want to ask you um, to clarify on the, the hypersexualized thing. Uh, are you referring to other people sexualizing me as I was younger or me being more sexual than other kids? Sorry, I think I actually misspoke when I, uh, I should have said hypersexual versus hypersexualized. Sorry. Okay. No, that's, so, funny. that's why I wanted to clarify. That yeah, no, absolutely. Was. Absolutely. So here's the funny thing is... I feel like you guys probably pulled that from a very early interview that I did in my career. Now, I might be wrong. It could have even been a year ago. But I've been, I've been in therapy for the past year and a half now. And I'm starting to learn that there was nothing hypersexual about me as a child. I simply feel that I was hypersexual because of the shame that was that, that I had inside about being sexual because... To me, it was like nobody else felt these things. Nobody else was talking about them. And so I felt like I was out of the norm. Like I had more sexual urges than other kids my age. When in reality, looking back, like when we were all playing like truth or dare or spin the bottle or whatever, it, doctor, you know, like kids do things. They just do. And the other kids were participating too. It wasn't just me. So I wasn't the only kid having those thoughts and wanting to explore and things like that. So I do want to add that caveat that I don't, I no longer feel that I was hypersexual as a child. I think I was very a normal sexual child because we all are, because even babies touch themselves. Babies masturbate because it feels good. Like it's just instinct. Um, so the second part of the question which I know there was nothing about the question that was hypersexual, but you said something about... Uh, it's basically how do we honor and respect their sexuality instead of stigmatizing it? Right. Like, while protecting them from CSA, from child sexual abuse. Um, I think one of the ways we honor children's sexuality is allowing them the space to explore. Personally, my family, if they caught my brother masturbating or they caught me, like, humping stuff we would be in a lot of trouble and there would be a lot of like, I don't remember if we would get like, I've blocked it from my brain because I, I don't remember if we got spanked. I don't remember if we got a timeout or grounded. I have no idea what actually happened. I just know that the feeling following being caught masturbating was deep, deep shame that I was doing something very wrong. So we honor their sexuality by letting them do their thing. It just, 
period. Um, the other thing is, especially when you talk about older children, right? Like teenagers, uh, that are past puberty and very sexual because it's a time of crazy hormones. We (laughs) give them the resources you give and give your kids honest answers. When they ask you stuff, give them, give them, like tell them the truth, but give them age appropriate answers, you know? And with teenagers, you prevent child sexual abuse by giving them the time and space to explore those things with age appropriate partners or by themselves. If you never teach your child about masturbation, if you never give them, you know, a good example might be like a dildo. Like, I don't even know what the, I I can't even tell you an age that it's appropriate to give your child a dildo. Like it sounds crazy to me, but I know deep in my heart that it's true because if they don't have any outlet to explore those things, they're going to explore it with someone who has the potential to exploit them. Me personally, I've actually never talked about this um, in relation to my industry work, but I think I'm finally ready to talk about it. So I think with you guys is the perfect example. I was uh, the victim of a, like a grooming thing, but I want to make sure I emphasize the point that it was very nuanced. I've talked about it a lot in my therapy sessions And it wasn't something like there was just this like evil predator, you know, taking advantage of a young girl. And like, yes, that's what happened. But he also wasn't that old either. There were, there were genuine, um, at least on my, on my end, there were genuine feelings for him as there are with many kids who are groomed. But with him, it wasn't, um... While there might have been some malintent, I also know deep in my heart that that wasn't the whole story. And what happens to me a lot when I tell people about this experience is they just paint him as this evil person and it actually negates my feelings about what I went through and how when he left me, it left me in pieces because I didn't understand. And the reason that he was able to come into my life was because I had no other sexual outlets. I had no one talking to me about sex. I had no one showing me that my sexual urges were normal and okay and they loved me for it. So I had to go seek that love somewhere else. And so there was an opportunity there for him to exploit that younger sexuality and be the person to show me what's, what's what. Um, And if somebody had talked to me about sex, if somebody had told me it was okay to masturbate, maybe I wouldn't have never, like maybe I never would have let him as close to me as I did. So that's how we stop it. Well, thank you very much for sharing that with us. It means a lot. Um, Now that you've unburdened yourself with that, I'm gonna move into something a little bit more taboo. Uh, Speaking of which, you wrote the storyline for the pure taboo scene, A Daughter's Love and help to direct it. Tell us a little bit about how that came about and what inspired you. You know, it's funny. I was doing, because I was trying to come up with stories to submit to them because they do their model collaborations all the time. And I wanted to submit something really great that they were going to want to jump on right away. So I had a brainstorming session. I was writing down a couple ideas that I, I liked, but I wasn't in love with any of them. And I just felt blocked. So I did a writer's block exercise and... It was literally like, think about like what you would like to be able to write about. Give yourself permission to write badly. And then set a timer for three minutes and then stream of consciousness. And that's what came out. Okay. That's really Uh interesting. Yeah. So it wasn't something that I had pondered a long time. It wasn't like a personal fantasy of mine it was literally just like I wanted to be able to write a creepy story about an overprotective mom Mm -hmm. and then I gave myself permission to write badly and I just went and at three minutes I came up with that story in three minutes I I promise you granted then I developed it but the whole plot the whole plot line I came up like that it's amazing when things just come together isn't it (laughs) (laughs) tonight mommy's having a boy over a boy? Well, my girlfriend's hooked me up with a boy and father will always be important to me, but it's time for me to move on. 
You want me to be happy, don't you? I can't believe how often you've been over. It's been like almost every night, hasn't it? I think you're right. Right? <laughs> I'm just having so much fun. Uh, so what were the limitations placed on you by the studio and its lawyers? In particular, when watching the scene, your character, uh, when watching the scene and your character, it seemed as though she may have originally been written as younger. Is that the case? No, actually. And a lot of people have asked me if it's a DDLG scene, and it's not. And I th it makes sense that people ask me that because I do have my DDLG work that people know about. So to see me play a character that's actually dressed similar to my DDLG character, I totally understand the confusion. It's literally supposed to be like a horror movie. Like she was completely always supposed to be 18. It was supposed to be um, like one of the dresses I wore is literally a costume from The Shining. From the twins. Oh my gosh. <laughs> um, the whole idea was just that my mother has been so overprotective and has just made me her little doll. So I wasn't supposed to be underage at all, ever. It was just like, I'm this creepy horror movie doll that my mom has like made for herself. Uh, so you've mentioned DS and you've mentioned uh, DDLG a little bit. So I'm going to ask, do you identify as little? Yes. I do identify as little on some days, and some days I'm a middle, and some days I'm a big. I think that's the case for most littles. Uh, let's see. So you identify as little. Are you a submissive little? Are you a dominant little? I'd say I'm kind of a switch, but leaning okay. on the submissive side. So okay. my little persona, very, very, very submissive, but it's kind of like a topic. I feel like almost all littles, submissive littles, we can't, we're kind of topping from the bottom just because you're kind yeah. of like – Oh, daddy. <laughs> like, I really want this really cute pink dress. <laughs> so, like, I'll be extra good. I'll do whatever you tell me. But really, I'm just like whipping him into shape to getting me that dress. So as a little, I totally feel you on that one. <laughs> Completely understand. There is a little bit of a topping from the bottom thing there. We don't admit it most of the time, but it's there. Uh, <laughs> and so in a DS context, are you also a switch? I don't explore... DS very much. Yeah, I, I've done it more so for scenes. Um, and in scenes, I've switched just because of whatever they cast me as that day. But my my DS in my personal life is pretty limited to DDLG. Obviously, the vast majority of the adult industry, as well as their fans, are against real-life abuse of the kinds that are depicted in some of the more taboo genres. But should anything more be done to educate audiences that fantasy shouldn't reflect reality? I think something should be done in our sexual health education system. Porn is entertainment. It's not meant to be an educational tool. Yes, there is educational porn out there, and it's great. But it is not our job to educate people. That's the job of teachers and parents and things that should be done from an early age so that people can differentiate reality from fantasy. You know, we never hear the same questions being asked of the writers of Marvel. You know, right. do we need to differentiate between superheroes and reality? No, because people understand that it's for entertainment. Parents talk to their kids, say, oh, it's just a movie. Oh, that stuff's not real. Like, oh, it's just pretend or make believe. But nobody talks to kids about porn. And they freaking should because they're right. watching it. They are. Mm -hmm. Like, sorry for the parents that think they're not. They're watching it. And if we can't talk openly and honestly with our kids, who else is going to teach them? Not, not the school system, because, you know, even though we're supposed to be uh, that separation of church and state. Yeah, yeah abstinence-only education. Exactly. It doesn't, it doesn't work. And so, yes, absolutely, there needs to be more done to educate people about the differentiation between fantasy and reality. But I don't think it's the job of people who are in the entertainment business. So is there one thing that you wish lawmakers knew about pornography in the adult industry? Uh, or if there was one thing <laughs> that you wish lawmakers knew about pornography in the adult industry, what would it be? I feel like it's kind of a, an overarch. Like it, there's like no one thing because everything's connected to something else. Um, but probably just that we are all... Kind of like we're all our own business in this industry. Um, 
there's not a union. I mean, there is, but nobody's a part of it because it's not a real union. Um, mm -hmm. There's not a lot of protection for the individuals in that sense. Um, like, they, and also just the sense that, like, I wish they realized we were all our own business because mm -hmm. there would be some regulation, um, which right. would help performers. Uh, they would see us as legitimate. Uh, right now, the small business loan application for the, the stimulus bill, if you are a sex worker, you are excluded from being able to apply for yeah. a small business loan. Um, so if they saw us as businesses, then we would be a part of that, but they don't see us that way. They, another reason to, to see us at individuals as businesses would be like, it all goes back to regulation and like testing. They would understand that we all get tested. They wouldn't be trying to impose their own version of testing. Like Prop 60 a few years ago uh, was like the condom law dental dam law like there is a condom law in place but the prop 60 got kind of intense where like any civilian could sue a porn performer if they didn't see a condom in a single frame of porn yeah. um crazy yeah so they don't see us as self-regulating that we get tested and we all do and they also like there's so many things oh my gosh <laughs> uh <laughs> Another, the biggest one to me is if they saw us as businesses and there was regulation, there would be a system in place to help performers who need to report abuse by people on set. I was just talking with somebody like yesterday, maybe the day before, that we could implement, even if it's a system like the military, you can just report somebody and then, you know, just check, I want to take action or I don't. And then if 10 different people are reporting something similar, then, then there's something to look at. Because a big part of people not wanting to come forward in this industry is the repercussions. Because there's no regulation, companies can just blacklist performers for speaking up about abuse. So people stay quiet and then more people experience abuse. You know, we talked about earlier, like by and large, it's not, but there are bad apples. Right, but and so there needs to be a better way to weed them out as it were yes exactly so i just want them to see us as a legitimate business for all of those reasons you started doing porn when you were 18 and in college looking back do you have any advice that you would have given your younger self i probably would have taken more classes in person than online um i probably would have voiced my opinion less on social media <laughs> to make a really good brand for yourself you just need to be a blank slate for a guy to jerk off to i have a lot of my personality in my porn and don't get me wrong so many of my fans love me for it but i do think i could have had a bigger name if i had uh been a little little less uh <laughs> sassy sometimes uh i mean I definitely appreciate your personality and the way it shows through in your work. Uh, do you do you worry that there's any chance that if you weren't quite so uh, able to advocate for yourself, it might have been a more uh, abusive situation? I don't think so because I was definitely very timid when I started. I had, like my very first scene, I was pulled into the director's office and he did make me very uncomfortable. And I sat there frozen. I didn't advocate for myself, but I also didn't let him take advantage of me. So even though I was very quiet about it, I didn't just go along with what he said. And so, no, it, I don't. I don't worry if I was less outspoken because even when I wasn't outspoken, I didn't let anything happen to me. I think it's the girls who feel like they really have to do something in order to keep getting work that. Uh, suffer the most from that. Thank you so much for your time. It was wonderful talking with you today. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. And thank you for listening to this month's episode. Please subscribe to make sure you don't miss future episodes. If you're watching on YouTube, there's a button to the side of me right now that you can press to subscribe and another one that you can use to donate towards our work. Thanks again and see you next month.